everyone, I'm Joel Green, and welcome into Curiosity Quest, the show that continues to explore what you, the viewer, are curious about. Now, today, our quest center came to us from Charlotte, North Carolina. Chan wrote, Dear Joel, I'm curious, how do they make chips? Well, Chan, as you can imagine, this is a very popular subject. We are out here in Rancho Cucamonga, Southern California. We're at the Frito-Lay factory where we're going to learn how they make chips. So let's begin today's Curiosity Quest. Grab a snack. Let's go. We're standing out in front of the Frito-Lay factory and I'm here with Manny. Manny, my tour guide, tell me how long have you been here? Joel, I've been here 14 years. Currently I'm running the uh, corn business unit. We make products such as Cheetos, Flamas, Tostitos, Doritos, Fritos. <laughs> uh, there's three, four different types of Fritos that we make here, so we're going to really dig into that today. We've been making Fritos corn chips since 1932. Wow! Well, and the key thing there is We've held on to the same basic principle of making the Fritos. It's corn, oil, and salt. Oh, so wait, wait that's it? That's, that's how we're making the whole chip? That is the mystery behind Fritos corn chips. Well, there's the show, guys. We know how chips are made. Let's go. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm totally kidding. I'm totally kidding. We're going to actually see how they're made today. Absolutely. You're going to see from beginning to end what it takes to deliver a package of Fritos corn chips today. OK, and what's our first step? First step is to get ready with the proper PPE. For those that don't know, PPE is? Personal Protective Equipment. Mm. Let's do it. This is, come on, come on. What, what are you doing? What, what, what's going on here? Come on. Now, are we ready? We are finally ready to go to the floor. Let's go! <laughs> Fun fact, fun fact, fun fact. Here's your fun fact. Did you know that farmers plant corn on every continent except Antarctica? Manny, what is up? We get all our PPEs on. You take me to the factory, have that aroma just hit me and go, oh my goodness. So tempted, but I won't. And now we're back outside. What's up with that? I wanted to show you the mystery called the rail cars. <laughs> okay, we actually have rail cars that come to our facility to actually deliver our raw materials. So since we're talking about Fritos corn chips, we wanted to take you out here to actually show you how we get our corn. Take me from the beginning. Where is this corn coming from, first of all? It's grown in the, in the states. It's actually from Nebraska, okay. uh, most of it. They're basically coming in through these rail cars, and then, and then you say they have to go in these silos right here? Yeah, so uh -huh. once we offload it, uh -huh. we, we have to offload it into the silos. How, how do you offload it? You got people shoveling like it? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How's it Absolutely done? Absolutely not. We actually have a fully automated system. Uh, once it's enabled, we'll actually have a drag chain come here that's set up underground. Oh. And it goes underground, and then it'll come out of the underground and go straight into the silo system. So this is the stock, the raw materials, as you said, to make all the chips. Absolutely. How big are these silos? How, how much corn do they hold? So these silos are actually about four stories high. Whoa. And they have a capacity of approximately over 200,000 pounds of corn each. 200,000 pounds of corn. Yeah. That's a lot of corn. A lot of corn. How long does it take you to go through one of those silos? We actually get a chance to turn over a silo within a week's time frame depending on production. You're telling me that in one week you're going through 200,000 pounds of corn? Yeah, absolutely. Do you know how many pieces of corn are in every chip? 
That would be a challenging one to figure out, but I'm sure we can do the math on that and we, get, oh, get wait, back wait, well, Ow, ow, wait, wait, did you say math? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm sure it's a math problem, right? Yeah. We're in the math world, so yeah. we can probably figure it out. We'll definitely get you close to that answer by showing you how do we convert corn into the masa that it takes to produce a chip. Now that sounds like science now. Yeah. Wait, we have math and science on me. Yeah. All right. We're going to send you away with a PhD from here. So. Wait, plenty of hardy <laughs> Doritos. There you go. PhD, got that? So. Getting the corn off of here, opens up, conveyor under the uh, ground where we're standing. Right. And then it's put in these big silos. Right. And uh, what's next? And then once we have it in the silos, we'll actually, as the system needs it, we'll, we'll transfer it from the storage to actually the cleaning process, which is the next step of our uh, corn treatment. Okay, we're clean, but let's go. Let's go see how the corn is clean. I'm following you. All right, let's go. What are chips made out of? Carbohydrates and um, whatever fruit or vegetable they're sticking into the chip flavor, artificial flavoring. Corn, starch, and other stuff. Manny, how do they clean the corn? So as we saw at the last stop, once the corn is shot over, mm -hmm. uh, this is the first cleaning process where it starts. So the first piece of equipment, what it does, is it actually sifting the corn. What it does is it loosens up the husk and it also filters out the broken or chipped or small size or big size corn. When you say husk, are, are you just talking about like a kernel of corn? Yeah, I'm talking about the layer outside of the corn. And you're trying to get rid of that? You're trying to remove it to allow for more consistency for the corn to be able to cook and then produce the masa that we need to get out of the corn. Wow, and what's that noise I keep hearing? That is the air system that's moving the corn over. <laughs> That is crazy. That's loud. That's loud, and it's all fully automated. You're working even though you're not working right now. Yeah. From the sounds of it, nothing's working. Ah, there, look at that. There it is again. Timing. We did not audio doctor that. I want you to know that. That wasn't us. That was good timing. All right, let's go. All right. All right, Manny, the temperature changed. It's like warm in here, what's going on? Yeah, so this is the next stage of the corn cooking process. Here, we're gonna actually cook the corn that we shot over from the corn cleaning room. Okay. So wow. what our purpose in this stage is to break down the corn and to make it more consistent by cooking it in heat and water. Oh, wow. uh, from there, the next stage is once the corn reaches at that point, it gets, uh, transferred over to the soak tanks. As you can see, it, it's gonna fill it up to the desired uh, level, which is monitored by the, the meter. And at that point, uh, the corn sits there for several hours. And it looks like butter. So what you wanna see as a visual check is the golden color of the water that you see. So you didn't add any butter to that. That's just the... The yellowness you get from the starch in the corn along with breaking down along with the actual color that the corn has, which is a yellow color. So okay. that's where you got the yellow from. So after it sits and soaks for several hours, no exact time, then what? We can show you what it looks like uh, at the point where the soap tank's getting empty. Uh, so this soap wow. tank's actually getting emptied. As you can see, Outside of corn, there's actually some other type of buildup that you see in there. Yeah. That buildup is actually the separation of layers of corn. And we have pumps underneath that are going to basically move the corn with water through the pipes onto the processing line where we're going to actually do the final treatment of the corn. You know, it's amazing because when I look at this right here, I, I can see remnants of what was corn. Right. I mean, it looks familiar. It looks like cream of corn almost. Right. And so this is, I mean, in all these vats that are filled with water, this is what's underneath that water. That's what you want to see because that has removed the unneeded uh, layers of the corn that it originally had. Okay. okay. So at each step, our goal is to filter the corn to the point where we get to the, the true core of the corn, and that's what we convert into masa. So we're going to test you at the end to find out what exactly is masa and what does it look like. I'm guessing it looks something like this. You would be wrong, it looks nothing like that. <laughs> All right.
fun fact, fun fact, fun fact. Here's your fun fact. Fritos original corn chips are made with the exact same ingredients today as they were in 1932. Corn. All right, so basically what you're seeing over here is uh, the corn is coming over from the corn cooking room uh, through these pipes and it falls into this hopper. Okay. This hopper is our storage hopper and from there it enters the tumbler. Whoa! Whoa! So this is the last point where the corn is going to be cleaned with water. So at this stage our goal is to remove any kind of build up, all the loose and husks that we saw in the corn cooking phase yeah. and get the corn kernel completely clean. From here it falls into the conveyor where it, it yeah, goes I see it right below me right there, yeah. That's pretty much it. So obviously corn is on the conveyor belt and moving at a very slow pace. Right. And I see different, like looks like white corn, yellow corn, like you said, a mixture. I'm close to 50% of each. Now what's all this water, is this a recycled water you're That is about? recycled water. Oh, okay. It's all the stuff that clean. You're right. Cool. And what's that, what's that feeling I just felt up here? So what you just felt is once the corn gets cleaned and drained, it enters this area. This is a small hopper. Right here you have the grinder. Okay. And this is where corn turns into masa. What is masa? I think it's something you can eat that's ground up, but maybe like a hummus? I know that it's something that um, Native Americans used in the past, and I believe it's something that you can eat. What is masa? So this is pretty cool stuff. We went from this to this. If I follow the process correctly, this is corn. But corn that has been consistently picked, cooked, and cleaned. So, that's where the consistency and the uh, stabilizing of the corn comes into play. Look how fine the masa is, and it's very consistent. And what that in turn turns into is the, the corn chip. It's like thick, it's like really thick. And as you say, it's what? It's very consistent. <laughs> so as you can see, there's not a lot of layers left on the corn. Yeah. All the husk is removed, and this corn is ready to be grinded into masa. All right, so once you have your masa, what do we do with it? Now, after masa, our goal is to convert it into shapes of Fritos corn chips. Okay. And from there, it goes right into the fryer, and it gets cooked, and from there, it goes right into seasoning. Can we see that? Absolutely. All right, so hold this. See it. Fun fact, fun fact, fun fact. Here's your fun fact. Hey, check it out. Did you know that January 29th is National Corn Chip Day? This is what our true Fritos line will look like, where it's all enclosed. Yeah. So our masa flows through the hopper into the, the top secret machine that cuts the Fritos corn chip. Which I see right behind me here, right? Right. Wow. So here you can see ah. the actual finished product coming out of the fryer. You'll notice how much the fryer is enclosed. Yeah. That's because of, again, safety number one. We got to make sure our people are safe. So we want to keep them away from the hot oil. Along with, we want to ma uh, manage the oil from getting oxidized. Okay. So that the more it's exposed to oxygen, it breaks down the oil. So we don't want that. How long from the time it's up top till right here? No more than 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Ballpark, yeah. Wow, that's, that's pretty quick cooking. And I can see, it looks like it's pretty hot coming out too. Right, it's very hot. You're actually not supposed to touch the uh, product until it reaches the seasoning phase. That's where you can use a bucket to actually take the product to go test it. Where's the seasoning phase? Now you wanna go taste the product and see the finished product. Wait, wait, is that a question? No. Yes. What is your favorite chip? I really like sun chips. Doritos. Um, probably the Frito chips. I like the, uh, I like Doritos. Um, but yeah, Fritos, Frito Lays. Lays chip uh, with lemon. Fritos. What's going on in this tumbler? So now this will be the last time you'll see a tumbler in the Fritos corn chip process. 
you're actually, this is the last step in processing where we're gonna apply the seasoning. So what we're running today are the original Fritos corn chips. Uh -huh. So we're applying salt onto the chips at this stage. So when, when it's tumbling, it's obviously at the right temperature. Right. And what's what's happening? Your season's being put on it, huh? So what you're trying to do with the tumbling process is to gain consistency of seasoning. Here we go. There's that word again, consistent. OK, all right, go ahead. You don't want chips to be layered on one another, so you want it to be tumbling so that you get constant seasoning coverage on all of the chips. From there, it comes out. We have a quality check where our team members We'll come here and actually check the percent seasoning content of our uh, in our chip, okay. and based off of that, make adjustments to the machine. I don't see any team members around, so maybe I should step in. That's their way of saying you should be running the line by now since you've gotten the full training. I promise you, I'll be fired in a second. This is quite a stairway you have going up here. This is headed into packaging. How many are in each scoop, approximately? During a shift, we, we are able to produce anywhere around above 20,000 bags a shift. 20,000 bags a shift. Yeah. Is that just a corn chips, or is that? Corn chips. Oh, my goodness. Now we're headed into packaging where it all comes together. All right, so we're up on the what, second or third floor? This is the second level, so the product that you see here is actually coming from our distribution level where you saw the belt go up at the top. This is actually a weighing system that helps regulate the right amount of product going into it each bag. Wow. So depending on the bag size, you're gonna see the quantities differ in how many go in each of these buckets. So it's weird because as I'm looking down, it looks like two, possibly three, uh, what are these, whatever these are called, are openings. Right. So the intent behind that is you're trying to get the perfect combination which the machine figures out for you in order to get the right weight in the bag. Before we started, we actually had to wait a few seconds for it to start. And you says it stops and starts based on what? So the bag maker downstairs that makes the bag actually regulates this machine. Oh. So that machine is connected to this machine, and they're both connected to the point where this feeds that machine, so it's a push-pull standpoint. Okay, so if, he, if he's overwhelmed, it'll just stop, basically. Right. Okay, which right. so far he's not, because this thing's going the whole time here. Right. Our goal is for this to never stop. Oh, okay. Earlier I asked you how many pieces of corn were in a uh, corn chip. Do we have an answer yet? Well, right now you have a perspective of how many should be. By the end of the process, once you finish the obstacles we have in line for you, we're going to then get you the answer if you earned it. If I earned it. If you earned it. I think I earned some chips is what I'm thinking. Yes. All right, let's go to that then. All right. <laughs> you got a setup for me to be set up. Yep. You are finally at the last stage of the Fritos corn chip. I can touch something. We're going to ask you to package five bags in a row. All right. You do that one time or one at You got to try to do it one time. Oh, one time. OK. Yes. One, two, three, four, five. Make five. sure I get the numbers right. Like that? OK. That's pretty good. All, All right. right. All right. Oh. OK. What's that? What's that? There we go. Yeah? There you go. Now you got to fold it in. There you go. Man, now what? So now you got to check if there's a label on the case. Oh, it's a label. OK. All right, there's a label. Yeah. All right, and now we just put it on the pallet. OK. Manny, I put gloves on. I got prepared for one box. Come on now, man. I'm ready to go. What are all those boxes over there? After looking at the complexity oh, yeah. you showed us. Oh, here we go, here we go. Uh, yeah. I think one box activity was good enough. Now, the one thing that we do want to go over is our quality wall process. Is this something that I can do? Yes, you will take part in that with me. Okay, do I need the gloves? You won't need the gloves. All right. But well, you can take the gloves home for gardening or anything else. All right, let's take the gloves home. All right. All right. Fun fact, fun fact, fun fact. Here's your fun fact. The number of chips consumed on Sunday for the biggest game of the year is 14. 
Manny, this is the part I've been waiting for all day. You've been teasing me by taking me through this factory and showing me all the corn chips and chips and oh my goodness, and now we're here to actually eat some of them, right? Yes, we are actually going to eat. With a purpose. <laughs> with a purpose. <laughs> Eating alone is fun in itself, but we're actually gonna assess the product that we made with the reference product. What does that mean? Reference is what a Fritos corn chip should look like based off of our historical recipe. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the aim product that we should be making at all plants producing Fritos corn chips. <laughs> and as you can see, it requires a lot of strength to do this activity. I'm not eating enough and corn chips apparently. We want to start with a visual comparison of how close are we to our reference product. So what we want to look for is the chip color, mm -hmm. chip size. Uh, do we have a lot of bits and pieces versus whole chips? Okay, so we're staring at this for a little bit longer than I can handle. Can we now do that? You can actually go okay. taste the reference <clears throat> and <clears throat> tell me what you pick up. Corn. I really have that, that, that smell aroma of corn seasoning right there. That's good. So now that you've had that, now you can try the ones that we've produced at our plant. I've had a chance to sample each one several times. I don't know if I can tell the difference. Yeah. I mean, I, I crumbled these up a little bit, but that's about it. Mm, that's pretty much it. That's our product quality wall. And uh, mm. that pretty much ends our day of, you know, beginning from the rail car to finish product testing at the end to ensure our proper quality. By the way, earlier you were teasing me again uh, about, you were trying to, you know, we were trying to talk about how many pieces of corn are in one chip, and we are now gonna find out the answer. Drum roll, please, hold on, hold on. drum roll, please. Knowing how the day went, knowing all the information that we talked about, uh -huh. the answer to that question is top secret. Oh, come on, come on. People at home are going, what? Describe how this tastes. Crunchy and definitely corny. Has a corn taste to them. They're really crunchy and they're really delicious. Uh, grilled corn. <laughs> definitely corn, um, crunchy. It tastes crunchy, tasty, edible. Corny? <laughs> well, yeah, corny, I guess. Crunchy. It's crunchy. And it's delicious. Well, I'm going to thank Manny and everyone here at Frito-Lays in Rancho Cucamonga. And I especially want to thank you, Chan, for sending us on today's Curiosity Quest. Now, remember, every tasty adventure begins with just one person's curiosity. So I wonder, what are you curious about? I'm Joel Green, and I'll see you next time. Now, I'm sure they want me to tell you that this truckload of chips is going to a store, but I hate to disappoint them. It's going home with me. All right, Danny, are we ready to roll? We're ready to roll. Let's go, man. You want me to come back on the weekend so we can? We will call you back if this goes well to actually help us with the activity. So what do you mean, if this it all depends. Great. It all depends. It all depends. So can I climb the sidewalk? You can. Man, you're supposed to say no. Come on, we're, it's, a, it's a family show. You can, but I'm not. Uh, oh. No. No, we're not. Hey everyone, I'm Joel Green and welcome to Curiosity Quest, the show that explores what you, the viewer, are curious about. Now today our quest letter came to us from Morris, Wisconsin. Janet wrote, Dear Joel, I'm curious about penguins and how they take care of their young. We also got one from Walnut Creek, California. Hannah wrote, Dear Joel, I love penguins, but can you tell me why can't they fly? Well, because of you guys, we're out here in Long Beach, California at Aquarium of the Pacific, where we're gonna learn all about penguins. So let's begin today's Curiosity Quest.
We're up early in the morning, and I'm here with Marilyn Padilla. Marilyn, tell us a little bit about this place. Well, the Aquarium of the Pacific opened in 1998 in June. You're going to get to see seals, sea lions, sea otters, and even pet sharks. Like pet, like pet sharks? That's or right. Really? Actually touch sharks. We have over 150 <laughs> sharks you can touch in our shark lagoon. We even have jellyfish you can touch or sea jellies. Oh my goodness. And if you're up to it and you want to get your hands a little dirty, we can go behind the scenes and help prepare food for some of our penguins. Well, that is why we are here today. I didn't know I was going to go behind the scenes, but I, I love the way that sounds. But that's why we're here today, to learn about penguins. That's right. We have Magellanic penguin species here at the aquarium. Our June Keys penguin habitat opened in 2011. All right, so what do I have to do first? <laughs> so first, we're going to get our hands a little dirty. You're going to meet Sarah. She's our Aquarium of the Pacific penguin biologist. So let's go behind the scenes to our food prep room, and let's go get their fish ready. Cool. Sounds good. Let's go. Following you. Fun fact, fun fact, fun fact. Here's your fun fact. Today's fun fact is the Magellanic penguins were named after Ferdinand Magellan, who first discovered them in 1520. I'm here with Sarah, and Sarah, first of all, tell us what do you do here at Aquarium of the Pacific? I am one of the penguin keepers here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, so it's my job to make sure that our Magellanic penguins are happy and healthy throughout the day. All right, so what are we doing right here? So this food prep room here is where you prepare all the food for all the animals here at the aquarium, not just the penguins. About how many animals are we talking about? 11,000. So what's the first step? So we're going to go ahead and step right onto this foot bath. Okay. And that's going to make sure that all the bottoms of our feet are free of bacteria. So we like to keep everything that we give the animals as clean and immaculate as possible. So throughout the process here at the aquarium, you're going to see all kinds of interesting things going on. Right now, there's all kinds of different food prep going on. If you look over here, that's some of the food prep for our elsins, fancy word for diving birds. And we have some of our shorebirds too, so you can see that we're thawing some really, really cold, those are called silver sides. So that's kind of similar um, to what you're gonna see a lot of the seabirds eating. The penguins eat a little bit larger fish than that. This is our refrigerator. So this is probably the coldest you're gonna have to deal with today. So all right. You can go ahead and, and look on in here. And you can see that we have all kinds of pallets of oh, fish. Yes, okay. And what I like to do to start my day is I like to get my vitamins ready. <laughs> Not for you. But for, for the penguins. Now, I've already taken my vitamins because oh, okay. I've, I've gotten up uh, a little bit earlier than this. But these are actually penguin vitamins made just for penguins. Wow, what's in a penguin vitamin? All kinds of different stuff, all kinds of multivitamins. Uh, there's amino acids. Amino acids are really good for these birds. Oh. And birds have feathers, right? Right. So they have to keep I, them I, nice yeah. and healthy. Wait, wait, wait. Penguins have feathers? They do have feathers. Are okay. you ready for this? They have 100 feathers per square inch. A lot, a lot of feathers. Oh, my goodness. I, I, I bet you I'm not the only one that's going, whoa. <laughs> I had no idea. Wow. And so these vitamins are good for... Her. They help them take care of their feathers. What do penguins eat? Fish. Fish. What kind? Um... Rainbow. You have gloves? Okay, I gotta stop talking. All right. <laughs> no gloves for you. All right. no. <laughs> Did you hear that? I just pointed out that they have gloves on and she says, no gloves for me. You're what? gonna be a bird biologist today, right? Uh, well, you yeah. gotta get dirty. Oh my goodness, okay, well. It's... Well, these are actually really clean. So these are restaurant quality sustainable uh, capelin and herring. So this is herring here. Okay. So our birds eat their fish whole. Oh wow. So they're gonna eat this whole. Oh my goodness. They're big birds then. They weigh about five and a half to roughly 12 pounds. Okay. So they eat about a half a pound of food a day. Oh. Unless they're going through something like a molt or they're gonna get ready to lay eggs. Okay, wait, wait. what is a molt? Wait, wait, what is a molt? They're shedding their feathers. To shed, to shed feathers. Wait, wait, when you say a molt, what do you mean, like it? Okay, so birds have feathers. Mm -hmm. And they have to shed their feathers or molt their feathers once a year. Okay. So they go through what's called a catastrophic molt. Oh, wow. So penguins... That sounds painful. Yes. Oh, it is? Well, <laughs> it's a very stressful process for them. So they're basically regrowing all their feathers. Wow. So think about growing all the hair that you have once a year. Oh, my goodness. It's going to take a lot of energy. Wow, okay. So they eat a lot more fish right before that time. They eat about two pounds of fish okay. per bird. So it's just herring that they're eating? And capelin. And capelin. So okay. this is a capelin here, 
and this is a herring. Okay. So if you're a herring eater, because we do have some picky eaters here at the aquarium, you're going to find that out pretty shortly here. <laughs> wow. They okay. either eat a couple of herring a feed, mm -hmm. and they're three feeds a day. Okay. Or they eat a couple of capelin a feed. Okay. So when we're up there, if you hear me say, Robbie likes capelin. Give them a smaller fish. Wait, I'm feeding them as well? You're going to help me feed them, yeah. Oh my You're goodness. a bird biologist <laughs> for the day. I keep forgetting that. I, <laughs> nobody ever calls me that. So from now on, when you see me, I'm a bird biologist. If you take a look here, everything's kind of getting sorted. It's the same quality seafood or the same seafood that you would get at a seafood restaurant. Okay. I don't know how many herring you would like to eat, but um, you know, it's good. really good quality. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If there's anything slightly wrong with the fish, maybe it's missing an eye or it's scratched, that can grow bacteria. And that's the last thing that we want. We want to keep our animals as ha healthy and happy as possible. Wow. So we go through this step before we even get to the point where we're going to give those penguins that food. Now, what about the vitamins that we pulled out of the, uh, the refrigerator? Those we're going to have to sneak in. Oh. Because oh. these guys eat their food whole mm -hmm. and they do need their vitamins, we're going to put the vitamins here in this gill. So we're yeah. just going to go ahead and we have a nice mixture here oh, of herring goodness. and capelin. Oh, uh -huh. And we're going to go ahead and head right over to the sink and thaw. And this is going to be breakfast for our penguins. So let's go ahead and oh. let's start thawing this fish. Oh, see, it's starting to kind of move around a little bit. Uh huh. So now we have our thawed fish here. Mm hmm. Looks delicious. I know Absolutely. you, you want to just uh, okay. touch it there. All right, all right. So there you go. It. So here's our herring mm -hmm. and here's our capelin. Mm -hmm. Yummy. Okay. Yummy. Oh. I was just kind of testing you there. Making Absolutely. Sure you could I'm, handle it. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if I could handle it, but I did it. So. All right. What does a penguin sound like? Squeak, squeak, squeak. <laughs> what was that? Are you ready? Am I ready? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I didn't know. Did you know penguins actually make noise? They do. They make kind of a braying, a braying sound, ah, kind of like a donkey. Ah, a little ah, bit more bass, like. Ah, oh. Ah, ah, oh. Ah. I may be the penguin whisperer. You might be. The bird biologist, penguin whisperer. It depends on how well you've stuffed your vitamins. You said as we were walking over here that me, Joel, I would be able to touch a penguin. Yes, there's a possibility Whoa. that you can touch a penguin today. Is there a technique? Should I be doing something right? We're going to practice on our friend over here before we, we <laughs> let you loose in our exhibit here. OK. So, we're going to pretend that this is Newsome here. Mm -hmm. So I have this whole herring, right? Uh -huh. And he's going to eat it whole. So you're going to put it right in front of that mouth, and he's going to gobble it down. Will he bite my hand, finger off, arm no, off? No, they, these guys, okay. they want the food. Mm -hmm. If you were going to do something to them they didn't like, they could try to defend themselves. So oh. if the opportunity presents itself to touch a penguin, you don't want to go over the top because oh. they're, they're prey. So if you go over the top like that, that might startle them, and that might cause them to try to defend themselves. Okay. Instead, you want to kind of go nice and slow, kind of to the side like that. Now, you have to make sure you're doing it head first. Okay. Some like the belly to the left, some are like the belly serious? to the right. It's going to get very, picky. that's why we're doing this demo here before, <laughs> oh before it gets really crazy, because they're all going to just probably run up there and want their morning breakfast. But I think our penguins are telling us that they're hungry. I'm getting the nod off camera, too, like, we better go in is what I'm Yeah, hearing. we better feed them. So we're going to go in and, wow. Fun fact, fun fact, fun fact. Here's your fun fact. A penguin's stomach can weigh up to 20% of its body. Oh, wow. It's like a cave back here. This is our June Keys penguin habitat here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. But but nobody gets to see this back part, right? This is, this is a special place. You have to be a paid staff or a volunteer here at the aquarium. No, why do we have these, these two penguins back here? They're in the back right now. They're going to go back on exhibit in a little bit, but they're under observation. So we have them back here to keep each other company. And then when the time comes for them go, to go back on exhibit, they'll go ahead and uh, go back together. But I have to stop you. Uh-oh. <laughs> Because Brad, why don't you just turn around? We already real quick have a uh -oh. Newsom and a Jeremy ready to eat their breakfast. And they have their name. I see their names on their arms right there. They do. So what should we be doing? Because they're yeah, they're 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 chumming up to everybody, saying, "Where's yes. my food? Where's now, my breakfast?" Do you want to go ahead and give them those special herring that we prepared a little bit ahead of time? Um, sure. I'll go ahead and I'll do one. Okay. And you do the other penguin. Okay. So I'll let so, you. Uh, what you're going to do here, now you can hear their brain for us. They're excited. They really want to eat their breakfast. Thank you. 
Jimmy! You sound like my son! <laughs> Give me some food, Daddy! <laughs> Let's see, now I'm gonna do a quick little feed here of Newsom if he's hungry. See, oh, and there it goes. Oh, wow. It's just that easy. Go ahead and get okay, this to Jeremy. Well, I... This is Newsom. He already had his vitamin. I got you. No? no. Uh oh, you don't have the hand of the penguin oh, whisperer no. quite okay. yet. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna feed the rest of them because they are hungry, but I know you're, you're itching at the chance. Do you wanna touch a penguin? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I do. What do penguins feel like? Penguins feel a little bit. Soft and wet. It feels soft. It feels soft. It feels like a little cuddly teddy bear. So we're gonna go ahead here and we're gonna get Newsom. Oh wow. Newsom's only two. Okay. So he's still learning what life is like to be a penguin. If you wanna go ahead and give him a little scratch here on the side of the head. <laughs> oh my goodness. I cannot believe the feathers. Oh my. So did you think a penguin was gonna feel this soft? Absolutely not, absolutely not. So wow. you can really get a look at those 100 uh, feathers wow. per square inch there. And Newsom's one of my buddies, so we hang out with each other a lot. And it's he's been so nice deep. enough to let me learn some penguin anatomy here. So take a look, this is, a, this is his wing. It can also be called a flipper because they don't fly, right? They fly underwater. This well, is more of like heard. a paddle. Yeah. yeah. So if you touch his flipper, he's nice, he'll let you. Oh my goodness. You can feel oh that those goodness. bones in there are pretty hard. Yeah. And they're pretty, they're always preening himself now. Oh, I can't. So they preen or clean their feathers. Yeah. So he's a very friendly individual here. And his friend Jeremy here is also two as well. Wow. And they'll sit here and they will preen each other's feathers. It's called allo preening. All birds do it, not just Newsom here. I and had no you, idea. You're right. I always thought they were like, like, Flippers, like they would feel like rubbery. And they feel like really thick feathers, really dense feathers. And they have really dense bones. Wow. Birds that fly have air in their bones. Yeah. These guys do not have hollow bones. So they have dense, thick bones. And that's going to help them dive down in the water. Wow. Jeremy, that's my hand. <laughs> Is Jeremy here? Should I <laughs> Jeremy try? Jeremy might want to eat now. You want to try that special vitamin fish there? Let me just move my friend Newsom here out of the way. He just might, it just might be me. There you go! Oh. You did it! Yay! Oh, Good job, goodness. Jeremy. So we're going to remember that Newsom had two herring, and Jeremy had one herring that it was his vitamin fish here. Okay. Now, we do have other penguins here at the June Keys Penguin Habitat. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to head on into the exhibit, <laughs> and we're going to try to do a feed of the other penguins here, along with Newsom and Jeremy. What is husbandry? Uh, man penguin? Husbandry, isn't that like the people that like, I don't know, work with the animals, help the environment or stuff? Sarah, what do we have here? We have toys we're bringing out there? We have enrichment. <laughs> enrichment, I love enrichment it. Enrichment works in animals' mind. It gives them exercise or it allows us to do basic husbandry practices. Okay, you've said that term a couple times, husbandry. What, and it's on your badge. What is husbandry? Fancy word for animal health care. Wow. So basically my job is to make sure these guys are happy and healthy. So I like to do whatever I can, not only to make sure they're happy and healthy, but have some fun with them as well. Well, and, and the other thing is I know people are probably wondering, why do we have all these crates Exactly. Here? So Magellanic penguins are a burrowing species of penguin. But if you take a look, we have this nice soft mat oh. in here for them. And Jeremy, this is kind of his, his kennel. So he's kind of wondering what we're doing in here. But if you take a look, this would be pretty similar to a nest that they would have in their natural habitat. You can see they have um, nice short legs that yeah. give them that characteristic waddle because they're set so fat, far back in their body. So they look really funny on land and they're quite awkward as we just saw Floyd demonstrate <laughs> for yeah. us. Apparently he's gonna go ahead and uh, get his own uh, breakfast, breakfast there. <laughs> You're not gonna bring it to me, I'm gonna go get it. <laughs> I'm just, okay, and now we have a penguin party going on down here. Okay. But we can get a really good look at the way that they waddle. So they're definitely built for land. When we were on the outside walking up, I saw holes. And yeah, these holes that's lead where the to holes, these the back holes, here. So you can okay. see right through there. That's where Jeremy was kind of poking his head out at us. And you'll okay. see, you might see a couple penguins come out of their burrows because they have been hanging out in them a lot. Okay, lately. so we better get up there before they yeah, all think, end up down here. I think here. they're ready to eat. 
fun fact, fun fact, fun fact. Here's your fun fact. Did you know that the fairy penguin is the smallest penguin? It weighs about 2.5 pounds. So as I'm sitting here on the ground, I'm noticing this yellow stuff on the ground. What is this yellow stuff on the ground, Sarah? This is poop stains. <laughs> just going to say it. Uh, well, we here's the thing. People at home Sherry are thinking was, it, so. Sherry was working very hard to keep this exhibit nice and clean. We saw Sherry doing it when we came up. She was cleaning it and making it all nice. And this is something you have to do every day, right? I think you need to feed whatever. Oh, okay. Okay, whatever. What am I feeding? Whatever. Capelin. Wait, okay. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Let's do this the right way now, buddy. No? No. Oh, she's there we one go. Of our female penguin, so you can see that she's uh, she's not as large as maybe Robbie, our male here. Yeah, go ahead and just keep on giving her. Oh wow, on. really? I'm okay. gonna go ahead and give Robbie herring here because that's what he likes. Wow. If I <laughs> now they don't usually eat them off the ground. Okay. This is very bad manners, but thankfully Sherry has already cleaned the exhibit for us. <laughs> All right, Floyd got his herring. Oh. That's Shim. Shim loves Capelin. Shim loves Capelin. All right, Shim. Uh, no, not from you. He doesn't now, Shim love is one of our larger males. Um, it's a really good time, actually. You can tell the difference between males and females. So take a look. This is Kate here. All females have their name band on their left flipper. So you can see whatever. She's back again more? for some more Capelin. Oh, my goodness. That's like And we what? also have some porpoising going on here in the exhibit. What's porpoising? Porpoising is a way that they would try to get away from predators. But what they we find that they do here at the aquarium is they do that for exercise. So you'll see them porpoising throughout the exhibit, all pretty much usually after they've had their morning breakfast. And, and what what are they doing exactly? Like up and down and they're basically throwing their whole body uh, out of the water. Are you noticing something? I, I'm there? seeing the shaking going on exactly. right there. Exactly. There's a lot to take in, by the way. If you haven't noticed, I'm like, there's porpoising going on. We have shaking going on. Now, one of the questions that I know that people are curious about, because I'm really curious about. Why are penguins black and white, or in this case, look a little brown and white? Yeah, well, they're brown right now because their their feathers are starting to get worn because they're getting ready to go into that molt. Okay. Uh, so if you look at some of them, they look a little bit different. If you take a look at Robbie here, he's actually preening or cleaning his feathers. Okay, right over now, here. Now, the yeah. reason that they're black and white is for camouflage. Oh. So camouflage is a way that you blend into your environment. They are a prey species. If you look at them, their eyes are on the side of their body. Predators are right in front. But take a look at how she's black on top of her body and white underneath. So if you're in the ocean or you're above her and you're looking down, that dark color is going to blend in with the bottom or substrate of the ocean. If you're underneath the penguin and you look up, it kind of looks like the sky. It's nice and light. So that helps them blend in. And then see how their patterns are broken up like that? It's not just black and white. She has, don't worry about it, it happens to the best of us. <laughs> um, she's not just black and white, she has, well, she is just black and white, but yeah. those patterns are broken up. And that might confuse prey or fish uh, that she would want to eat. Okay. And the, the prey might not know where exactly she's coming from. If you look underneath them, they have patterns that are kind of broken up, which can confuse the, pre uh, the prey that they would want to eat. Okay. But the main reason that they're black and white is so they can blend in or uh, counter shade, camouflage to hide from predators. Wow, I didn't know that. Look at how they're made for the water. They're so comfortable in there. Sure. Uh, we sure. might have saw Floyd a little bit earlier trying to make it down those stairs. <laughs> yeah. uh, but they, they are yeah, pretty. Right, right here behind oh, us. Yeah, I don't Jeremy, know we, we, I don't didn't, we didn't mention him. So he got up there with those little toes that he has. They're very, very uh, flexible. Yeah. And he's sitting there preening himself like he's on a flat surface right now. Yeah. So, it's interesting to see the way that they can climb different substrates or environments, um, or in this case, the June Keys penguin habitat. Why can't penguins fly? Because they don't. <laughs> Why? Uh, hmm. <laughs> because they don't have feathers. One of the questions I had, uh, Hannah wrote, um, why don't penguins fly? Well, think about it. They spend most of their lives in the water. Mm -hmm. They've adapted to be able to live most of their lives in the water. So A, they're a little bit too heavy to fly. They have those thick, dense bones in there. Mm -hmm. um, B, they live in the ocean. So throughout the time of uh, 
living in the ocean. They've adapted to being extremely successful in the ocean and a little bit more awkward on land. We'll probably get a chance to see uh, from, to jump over? <laughs> from Newsom. Yes, that's exactly what. And he's kind of trying to hang out with you there. But gotcha. um, okay. they don't fly because they live in the water. So instead of having wings like you think of as a typical penguin, they have, oh, he's going to itch himself. Oh, he's going to oh, Right that. there. Good balance. <laughs> I swear he steals the show every time. Wow. Upstairs. But look at how he's really gently just preening right by his eye there. Uh, typically, another penguin would do that, but Newsom's too cool to have oh, help. Oh, and there I you got go. the thank you. That, this fist pump. There we go, buddy. <laughs> thank you, Newsom. That was thank you. You're being a great, great demonstrator. Yes. But um, back, back to why they can't fly. These are wings because they are a bird, but they're also known as flippers. Right. So they're kind of giving them that momentum in the water. It gives them the momentum to porpoise. It gives them the opportunity to swim up to five miles an hour. It gives them the opportunity to dive down about 100 feet to capture their prey. We had another letter that was sent us out here. How they take care of their young. It's, it's very interesting the way that they do that because they work together. Okay. Do penguins have one mate for life? It's possible, but it's not necessarily likely, if okay. that makes sense. Okay. So if they do have a mate, They'll have their breeding season together, they'll go their separate ways, and then that male will come back on shore and he'll call for his mate. She might not respond, she might realize, I don't really like you this year. Um, <laughs> that may not be, might not be around, it might have become uh, food for, for a predator, so that male might need to find another mate. So they don't necessarily look for that same mate, but if they happen to be around, they will uh, breed again for that season. But they don't typically mate for life. Gotcha. Sarah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, a smelly, fishy high, fishy five, high five. Scales I like everywhere. It. Scales everywhere. That's awesome. And thank you so much. Walk like a penguin. Ready? Go. I want to thank Sarah, Marilyn, and everyone out here at Aquarium of the Pacific for teaching us about one species of penguin. And I especially want to thank you, Janet and Hannah, for sending us on today's Curiosity Quest. And remember, every great journey begins with just one person's curiosity. So I wonder, what are you curious about? I'm Joel Green, and I'll see you next time. I'm scared. I'm scared. Oh, here we go. All right. Oh. <laughs> I touched the shark. I touched the shark. I'm going home. I'm going home. See? Get it.